everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Accelerated Data Workflows for Biomarker Discovery and Metabolomics Clinical Research Applications in Cystic Fibrosis Research. I am Marjorie Torres of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Agilent Technologies. Agilent is a leader in life sciences, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets. For more information, please visit www.agilent.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to ask as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problems through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Philip Britz McKibben. Dr. Britz McKibben is a professor at the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology and Cystic Fibrosis Canada researcher based at McMaster University. Prior to starting his current position, he completed his doctorate research with David D.Y. Chen at the University of British Columbia, followed by a visiting lecturer position at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and a postdoctoral fellowship with Shigeru Tarabe at Himeji Institute of Technology in Japan. He has research interests in bioanalytical chemistry and metabolomics includes the design of new analytical strategies to quantify and identify meta metabolites in biological samples using innovative separation, mass spectrometric, and bioinformatic tools. Philip's laboratory aims to discover new biochemical markers to support early detection and treatment of human diseases relevant to population or occupational health and pediatric or perinatal medicine with emphasis on inherited me metabolic disorders and the developmental origins of health and disease. For Dr. Britz McKibben's full bio, please see labroots.com. I will now turn it over to Dr. Britz McKibben for his presentation. Hey, thank you, Marjorie, for the introduction, and uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, my presentation, which is our great pleasure to share with you some of our recent developments in developing high-throughput metabolite screening uh, technologies based on capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry. Um, these will be aimed primarily to interrogate um, volume-restricted samples that are quite unusual, including for blood spot cutout samples, as well as sweat samples from one-month-old in infants who are screen positive for cystic fibrosis. And although the focus will be mainly on biomarker discovery, biomarkers not only for diagnostic or prognosis of diseases, but actually to provide new insights in terms of disease pathophysiology. Um, so with that, uh, I want to highlight that this, a lot of this work is actually collaborative in nature, including uh, a number of partners from Newborn Screen Ontario, from Agilent Technologies, uh, from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, as well as the Children's Hospital here at McMaster University. Um, funding uh, has been critical for this type of work, including from NSERC, CHR, and, and in particular, Cystic Fibrosis Canada. So this just gives you a look at uh, an outline in terms of some of the learning up outcomes, but also an overview of the themes of my talk. Um, first and foremost, I want to uh, highlight and define what metabolomics actually is. Um, and often, many researchers uh, struggle between the differences to emphasize in terms of targeted or expanded target analysis that's often hypothesis-driven. Uh, in contrast to non-targeted hypothesis-generating uh, metabolite profiling. In many cases, we actually uh, apply both approaches to our data workflow. Um, secondly, um, one big issue that we're trying to uh, overcome in metabolomics and like other omics technologies is how to improve sample throughput, yet at the same time maintain data quality. Um, and one of our solutions towards that is how to develop uh, multiplex separations um, serial through serial injections and how that can be used as a bioinformatic tool to enhance the quality for discovery um, for biomarkers uh, of relevance to clinical um, chemistry. Thirdly, um, another big, um, uh, I guess, uh, challenge in the field is how to identify unknown biomarkers of clinical significance. 
and how to reduce um, any bias or sampling artifacts that can come out of that. Fourthly, um, and in particular relevant to cystic fibrosis is what is in human sweat? How can we use non-target analysis to characterize sweat and how that can be useful to understand, again, the, the fundamentals of the, the disease pathophysiology? And could that be useful to go beyond sweat chloride to understand how the disease progresses and how it varies from individuals, even with the same genotype? So um, metabolomics might be considered, a, I guess, a modern functional genomic tool that really was developed and coined in the late 90s, um, really through the advent of mass spectrometry, NMR, and uh, computer technology. However, you can trace the origins of metabolomics back to 100, almost 120 years ago so through the pioneering work through, um, uh, through Sir Archibald Garrett, who first basically coined the, this notion of inborn area metabolism. And you can see with this publication, introduced the idea of almost like precision medicine. How do you can do chemical analysis of urine samples to indiv individualize uh, diagnosis? In this case, diagnosis for a rare metabolic disorder called acoptinuria. In this case, you can see that the phenotype, the phenotype is clearly present from uh, the presence of the dark urine. And the origin for that actually was traced to a small chemical, in this case, homogenistic acid, which later oxidized to produce this very pronounced phenotype. But through this discovery, he was able to use this to understand the disease from a mechanistic standpoint, but also as a potential diagnostic tool at the same time. So this is way beyond, uh, before the you know, discovery of the gene, the DNA, before the advent of mass spectrometry. Um, you can see the origins of metabolomics really goes back quite far. Um, from uh, the pioneer work of uh, Sir uh, Archibald Gerard, nowadays, uh, Preventative screening for rare genetic disorders is now through, done through universally through newborn screening programs that's uh, applied in most developed countries. Uh, for example, since the early 60s, uh, the pioneering work of uh, Bob Guthrie through the uh, development of uh, simple collection mechanisms through uh, paper uh, filter cards and the development of new, new assays to, to screen for rare metabolic disorders like phenylketonuria has really revolutionized uh, preventative health. Um, nowadays, in the last 20 years, with the advent of uh, tandem mass spectrometry, now one can actually screen uh, in a multiplex fashion, collectively, uh, a large number of rare metabolic disorders. And the, really the main theme here is early detection or pre-symptomatic diagnosis of rare but yet treatable uh, genetic disorders. And this all can be done in a cost-effective manner through tandem mass spectrometry. Um, so how does this relate to cystic fibrosis? Uh, CF was recommended to be included in the panel of, um, of genetic disorders to be screened for about, uh, about uh, now about 10 years ago or so. Um, however, it actually doesn't rely on mass spectrometry. It has a very unusual um, screening approach, and we'll talk about that and some of the limitations behind that. But essentially, some of the limitations with cystic fibrosis screening is that it has very poor positive predictive accuracy. Uh, it, basically identifies a lot of carriers who are not affected with the disorder. Um, and you can see typically in the province of Ontario where cystic fibrosis has been screened for the last about, uh, nine years or so, typically of the population born each year, roughly about 34 authentic cystic fibrosis cases are identified each year. But that's only a fraction of the screen positives. Most of them are carriers who are not affected. So if you just look at the uh, uh, screening algorithm that's applied for cystic fibrosis in most jurisdictions in North America, it's a two-tiered approach, essentially. It starts off with uh, an immunoassay for a pancreatic enzyme called the immunoreactive trypsinogen. This particular enzyme is quite uh, sensitive for CF, but is not specific. So you can see that the positive predictive value overall is quite low. Um, in order to improve specificity, any screen positives uh, for IRT that um, uh, exceed a, a cutoff will then be screened for a collection of uh, known mutation panels, a mutation panel for known mutation, disease-causing mutations for CFTR. Um, in this case, um, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but typically after those two tiered screen approaches, any uh, screen positive case will then be uh, mo uh, moved on to a confirmatory screen based on sweat chloride. So this is an unusual test, um, but this is the gold standard for cystic fibrosis screening. Um, however, you can see there's, there's actually some clinical challenges for, with this screening approach. Um, so first and foremost, um, at least in the province of Ontario, they categorize the screen positive cases in terms of three categories, A, B, and C. A are typically classic CF cases with two disease-causing mutations and high RRT. In most cases, uh, they're authentic CF cases. 
But to prevent any false uh, screen negatives, they actually include these two other categories that have either one or no mutations or uh, high or very high levels of IRT. The problem with that is you start identifying carriers. Um, and what it, this turns out to be is of all the CF uh, screen positive cases that go for sweat chloride testing, only 10 to 15% of cases are authentic CF cases. The vast majority, 85%, typically are screen negative. They have low sweat chloride, below 29 millimolar is the cutoff typically. However, there's actually another category. Um, so you'll identify cases that are inconclusive or ambiguous. They have intermediate sweat chloride cases. So you can see the CF screening approach and it's even the diagnostics are still challenging in terms of what to do when you start screening on a mass scale, especially relatively rare mutation uh, cases or uh, rare phenotypes of the disease. Um, and this just reiterates the next slide here, just showing that CF, although considered a classic monogenetic disease, um, it's actually quite complex in how it's expressed. It depends on many gene modifiers and it's affected by environment as well. And it's really a disease spectrum. So you have the classic CF cases with very low residual function, functional activity of CTR, which conducts primarily uh, the chloride. Um, but there's also intermediate ca cases as well, as we saw with the intermediate sweat chloride cases. Um, and although sweat chloride does a good job to discriminate between the CF cases um, relative to non-CF cases, there are these intermediate categories as well. So our main hypothesis was with these sweat samples obtained from the uh, infants that are screen positive, would there potentially be other markers that might help us understand the disease and how it progresses, but also as a secondary test as well, but also can might help, help alleviate and understand these intermediate cases in terms of which ones will uh, progress into CF or not. So this was the main focus of our, of our uh, study in this particular case. So moving on to metabolomics, for those who are not, not familiar with it, um, I guess it's really referred to as the, a comprehensive, a non-target analysis of all small molecules, typically under about 1,000 Daltons or so. Um, and the, the big promise of metabolomics it's, uh, is its functional readout in terms of its close association with phenotype, as you saw in the previous slide, in the case for acuptinuria, with the black urine samples, and importantly to physiology as well. And, and this really has taken a backseat probably in the last 40 years because of the advent of molecular biology. But metabolome, you can see here, is, are not just uh, building blocks for biopolymers, but they're actually bioactive compounds, endogenous metabolites. But not only me endogenous metabolites from the cell, but actually what's really interesting about metabolomics, when you expand the definition, it actually includes environmental uh, and dietary compounds as well. So they're quite extensive, quite complex individually, but they really are at the interface between uh, environment and lifestyle and phenotype and physiology. And they're closely associated, of course, with gene expression. That's, that's I guess, a strong interest in metabolomics technologies. But as you'll see shortly, the technology used to do metabolite profile is quite distinct and quite different from the other omics platforms. And really there's no standard approach for doing comprehensive metabolite analysis. But typically, depending on the type of uh, biofluid or, or tissue sample that you wish to, to analyze, um, which can be anything from plasma to urine to, in our case, particularly interested in these very small amounts of sweat from infants or cutouts of dry blood spots, um, typically most people consider either a, an, an NMR-based metabolic profile that um, is quite robust, um, quantitative, and allows for identification of compounds. However, unfortunately, because of the low sensitivity of proton NMR, in most cases, the coverage of the metalloma is quite limited. However, for long-term term studies, it's a very robust platform. It's, it's quite favored in that particular context. Um, in contrast, uh, there's a growing sort of interest in mass spec-based metabolomic platforms, typically using various types of mass analyzers, often the time of flight, to QTOF systems, to Orbitrap systems, and other mass analyzers. You can see that the configuration used for ionization can, be diff can differ quite a bit, but typically it's electrosphere ionization. And you can see the configurations for separation before mass spectrometry could either be direct infusion if you're using high resolution mass spec or various separation platforms, including LC, GC. And the focus of this talk will be some of the, I guess, advantages of using capillary electrophoresis as a very unique high efficiency separation platform that's microscale but it can allow you to do a lot of interesting, um, uh, I guess, uh, approaches to improve sample throughput and data quality. But typically, the, weak, uh, the weakness of mass spectrometry is typically associated with the ionization source. So it's generally less robust. Uh, identification of unknowns is definitely more of a challenge, even with uh, tiny mass spec. Uh, 
in high resolution mass spectrometry. However, mass spec has a, the benefit of higher sensitivity and generally broader coverage. But again, um, in many cases, you have to use, you have to consider multiple separation platforms to get the, the, the best overall coverage. So there's no one solution essentially for metabolomics, and you have to consider multiple platforms uh, depending on the scope and coverage that you desire. Um, if it was just, just the analysis itself that was uh, the only issue, then you know, the problems could be manageable. But um, like other omics, um, you really have to consider the big picture, so including the pre-analytics involved with the, uh, the study design, how the collection is, uh, is, uh, is performed, uh, the type of samples collected, uh, of course, standard operating protocols to avoid bias, sample transportation storage, preparation. You want to ideally have very simple, simple sample prep uh, to minimize any potential bias or improve precision. Um, and then the post-analysis challenges in terms of processing. This is a big issue in bottleneck for especially non-targeted metabolite analysis. And ultimately how to interpret those results. So you can see in terms of the big picture, metabolomics has considerable challenges and it's more than just a, a, you know, analytical chemists that are involved with it, but you have to have good expertise in certainly bioinformatics and um, study designs. So moving on, um, one thing that we're trying to overcome in metabolomics is typically if you're using separations coupled to mass spectrometry that, that tend to be low throughput, and they involve complicated data processing steps as well that lead to bias, and they're not really suitable for large-scale epidemiological studies. So we've been uh, focused on developing faster, more robust, and low-cost screening approaches that allow for non-target analysis for biomarker discovery, but in particular apply for very small amounts of samples, as we said, as we uh, mentioned earlier with uh, dry blood spot extracts or um, uh, sweat samples from infants. And then this is just overview, gives you an overview of the challenges, the triad here, is how do you maximize sensitivity or metabolism coverage while, again, enhancing selectivity and resolution while at the same time trying to address issues with sample throughput and cost and minimizing costs. So very difficult to find a, a single platform that can basically address all three uh, issues as well. However, we think that uh, our platform is, does uh, do a really particularly good job, if you're, certainly if you're separating ionic and polar metabolites in particular, and especially if you're dealing with very small amounts or volume-restricted samples or small amounts of tissue or cell numbers as well, and typically involves very minimal sample processing. But you can see in the top left quadrant here, the, the CE is a really simple separation technique. Um, it's a, just essentially a hollow tube where you apply a voltage with a buffer. Um, and you can see that ions are separated based on their electrophoretic mobility, which reflects their essentially effective charge to size ratio. It's essentially um, smaller cations move faster than larger cations. Highly charged ions move faster than minimally charged ions. Um, the interface for CMS typically uses a coaxial sheet liquid interface, which is a, uh, basically a, has a nebulizer gas flow with a makeup flow for sheet liquid uh, that forms a stable spray to, again, ionize ions in the gas phase. One thing to really highlight here is um, that uh, the separation occurs under isocratic conditions, so uh, constant composition. More importantly, the sheet liquid in the interface also provides constant composition for ionization. These, were two, these are two important issues, uh, or I guess elements of this, the technique that allow us to do the multiplexing, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and, and question here in the picture on the right side here, this is not our particular lab, but a lab in Japan where their answer to sample throughput is simply to, to purchase more equipment and run things in par massively in parallel. Um, that was a, really wasn't a feasible approach in our particular case. And our question is, how can we get more value out of our mass spectrometer by multiplexing the separation, but done now in series? Before I do that, this just gives you an example of the type of um, metabolites you can typically measure. This is from a urine sample, for example. Um, for biobank samples, when volumes are quite constrained, again, CEMS is quite useful in that case. We can make use of even down to five or, or less microliters of sample. But you can see the variety of metabolites that can be analyzed in urine with simply a, a dilution step. So the sample prep is very straightforward. Um, and each individual metabolite has been studied individually um, in epidemiological studies as risk factors for chronic diseases, ranging from diabetes to um, cardiovascular diseases as well. And what's nice about the metabolism coverage by, by CMS is essentially is you can assess not only um, nutrients, but also environmental factors, including intake of polyphenols by the excretion of poly, polygallosulfate, as you can see in the bottom of the case here, 
Um, and you can look at drug intake or alcohol intake as well. All these lifestyle factors that we know are quite important um, in terms of uh, disease risk assessment. Um, the next slide here just shows you essentially um, the principle of the uh, technique that we developed. So uh, essentially most separations uh, inject uh, on the column one single sample, you elute it, often with the gradient elution, you recondition the column and repeat. However, this process is quite low throughput um, and uh, involves lots of complications when you're processing large numbers of samples, including time alignment issues. With CE, what we can essentially do, you can see in the top trace here, we're essentially just injecting a series of discrete sample plugs that are buffered in between just a buffer plug, essentially interspersed by buffer plugs. This is a series of hydrodynamic injections, and you can see that we're loading the capillary, almost a third of the capillary with um, discrete sample plugs, essentially. Um, the second trace here, you can see below, you apply your voltage, and now the separation occurs. And remember, this is under steady state conditions, so under continuous buffer. So all the ions with each respective sample will migrate with the, the same mobility, essentially. And if you look at the bottom trace, this is the extracted ion electric program, and here you can see three examples of uh, metabolites, and you can see that they enter the ion source that are offset in time by just a few minutes, and these are the same samples being injected in this particular case. The second trace you can see for the leucine isomers, what's really nice about this technique, you increase throughput with the same typical, um, I guess, an analysis time, of, say, say 20 to 30 minutes, but more importantly, you still retain most of the separation performance in terms of the isomer resolution. So for seven sample plugs, you have uh, three isomers, you have 21 resolved peaks. Things that co-migrate, as long as their mass is different, you can then resolve them in the second dimension uh, through the time of flight mass spectrometer. And the time of flight is particularly a very robust, moderate to high resolution instrument that has fast data acquisition is perfectly suited for this type of technique, especially for high, se high efficiency separations with CE, especially when you're multiplexing it in series. So you can see that there's no modifications to the system, it's a very simple approach to improve throughput. The second trace shows you in a good example of a, a real plasma filtrate sample that's being analyzed. These are seven plasma filtrate samples introduced again seven times in the same capillary in the same run with one mass spectrometer. And a good feature about CE is you can see in the total ion lich program this large bulk uh, signature signal here. This is basically the co-elution of massive amounts of sodium um, that of course is a major uh, ion in most biological samples. This would lead to typical suppression issues, but because CE is such a great desalter, um, a lot of the inorganic ions migrate very fast prior to most of the organic metabolites that have slower mobilities. So you can see in the highlighted trace atop that all these little needles, the needles in the haystack are then resolved from the, the, the bulk salt essentially to avoid suppression issues. And if you extract those compounds based on their accurate mass, you can see again, you see seven consistent peaks are being uh, resolved all in that same analysis time. Um, the electric osmotic flow, this, um, this flow generated for neutral compounds you can see migrates at the very end of the separation. This includes even EDTA, other additives that are included with the blood collection system, which would also lead to suppression issues. So this really works, um, and it's not just like analyzing the same samples repeatedly. What's really interesting is how you use the multiplexing that reflects your study design. So in the top left trace here, you can see you can essentially perform an external calibration in a single run, right, by simply injecting a series of, uh, in this case, lactic acid standard solutions, so you can get a good calibration performance. The second trace is kind of interesting. You can then use the seven sample plugs to do um, analysis of, in this case, uh, this is an exercise intervention study involving um, plasma samples. And what you can see here is um, the two first samples you see here are the um, individual, the same individual in the, the resting state, the placebo in the treated state. This, the next two samples here, this one over here, you can see that this is post-exercise after high-intensity interval training. And as you'd expect, you have massive levels of lactic acid buildup in the plasma, which you can see clearly in the signature. Again, this is the same individual. Um, and then you can see a small treatment effect. The treatment is from bicarbonate intervention and then recovery uh, three hours after exercise. So this is a, a temporal resolution of an individual uh, person undergoing exercise and a treatment effect. So this allows you to really um, identify biomarkers uh, in a single run essentially 
that is unambiguous. And we can actually do absolute quantification as well. You can see if you compare uh, the lactic acid measurements uh, from an enzymatic assay, it's a gold standard compared to a CMS protocol, very good um, uh, correspondence, both in terms of passing by blood regression and a per percent difference plot as well with minimal uh, bias, but um, overall pretty consistent performance. So you can do you can increase the throughput, you can avoid suppression, you retain most of the benefits of the separation, and you can potentially, in most cases, do absolute quantification that's consistent with um, um, alternative methods as well. Um, just moving on before we move on to the cystic fibrosis case, just giving a few more examples of what we can do with this type of technique. Um, you can see in this case, we're going to actually inject, uh, again, seven samples discreetly in the capillary, essentially. Um, but in this case, we'll have pairs of samples injected. You can see the first pair, the green uh, plugs that are shown here, they'll be diluted in a certain trend, so a one to do two dilution pattern here. The second, um, the second case here, this will be another, say, suspected disease case, but done in duplicate. But in this case, you can see the difference is we're gonna dilute in the same pattern, one to one ratio. And the third sample uh, beyond that, done in a two-to-one pattern. And what's really nice about this technique is within the same run, you can essentially include what we call a quality control sample. So within each run, this will be a, a, a normal, healthy, pooled sample. This will be our reference, essentially. And this approach um, just shows you the versatility of the technique and then allows for essentially an uh, easy way to identify both known markers but also unknown markers in terms of non-target analysis. So the first case for Part B here, you can see um, there's no evidence of uh, elevated citrulline, which would be indicative of citrullinemia. You can see the pattern is what you would expect based on dilution pattern. The small differences that do exist um, are just simply uh, biological variation. And more importantly, you can compare disease controls relative to um, relative to the healthy control, which is the, the sample zero here at the end. More importantly, you can see in trace C in the bottom left corner, uh, this is a, a profile typically for uh, phenylketonuria or PKU. Here it's very evident which is the biomarker and which samples are elevated. You can see the middle pair are grossly elevated by fourfold exceed the cutoff because we can do absolute quantification as well. And you can see that they're elevated both res with respect to the disease controls, samples uh, 1A, 1B, and 3A, 3B, as well as the healthy control. So you can see within a single run, you can get unambiguous data. Uh, and the same thing for the other example um, for maple syrup urine disease here, the branched chain amino acids are classic markers for the disease, including leucine, nisoleucine, as well as valine. And here you can see that the, uh, you have uh, elevation, once again, about fourfold elevation of valine in the sample that comes from a different sample case, um, which is clearly elevated in the first pair of samples. So we can identify the origin of the sample. Everything is elevated relative to the controls. Um, and more importantly, you can resolve an isobaric ion, in this case, betaine glycine, which is not uh, elevated in the case for maple syrup and urine disease. So we were able to validate our method for known biomarkers for known environmental errors in metabolism. So we wanted to proceed to see whether we can use the same approach to identify new markers for uh, diseases that are currently screened, such as galactosemia. So this just shows you another example of what we can do. Again, by encoding information in the separation, um, it's similar to what you would do with iso uh, uh, say isotopic labeling with mass spectrometry. Here is temporal encoding of the separation. And once again, what's really interesting in this case for the galactosemia case, this was uh, what we noticed in this case was a series of peaks that were only elevated in the galactosemia sample. This is a duplicate, again, pair of samples that were uh, injected in that particular pattern, this two to one pattern. We didn't know what those compounds were. Um, actually, the, the screen positive galactosemia case had an incidental increase of, um, of citrulline, in fact. However, that was uh, proven just an incidental finding. But if you see this case here, that what were these compounds? And basically, these elevated compounds were grossly elevated, upwards of 30-fold, in fact, relative to the other controls. And here we use uh, our QTOS system to do uh, collision-induced dissociation to basically derive a molecular fingerprint of the unknown compound. And uh, the take-home message essentially is, 
we're able to identify that this was actually an N-galactated amino acid. And there's a series of amino acids which were only elevated in the particular case for galactosemia. And the OPSDA plot here just shows you, just highlights that um, the glyphosate case was quite unusual relative to the other disease, uh, other inborn errors metabolism as the healthy uh, neonates as well. And in particular, uh, the galactated glycine and galactated glutamic acid were grossly elevated in both cases relative to the other controls. And this sort of makes sense in the case of the disease because you have essentially a defect typically of the second enzyme that processes um, uh, galactose. This is the uh, galactose phosphate urinal transferase enzyme that leads to an elevation of of galactose, and the elevated galactose then can lead to um, uh, undesirable effects and reactions with, in this case, free amino acid pool in cells as well. So just to give you an example that um, this approach can be useful for uh, confirmatory diagnosis or confirmatory screening of known disease diseases and, and known biomarkers, as well as revealing new markers that could potentially be applied for, uh, for mass spec-based screening as opposed to enzyme-based screens for galactosemia. So, um, and just to wrap up here, um, this just shows you again what you can do with the technique. So because you can inject multiple samples, we can design really interesting workflows here. So this will be a typical day operation for us to say analyze 50 samples in uh, actually in a half a day essentially. The first run we do is simply would be a standard mixture. You can see a standard mixture with a blank as our fourth sample and then repeat of three samples again. This is a, just a quality check. We then repeat the second run. Um, the second run here will be a QC run. This will be a pooled serum sample. And for serum or for blood samples in particular, the sample processing is pretty straightforward. It's just an ultrafiltration to remove protein and dilution uh, step essentially. Then for experiments three to eight, you can see in this case, we include always a blank run. So this will just track for any sample carryover effects. Um, and then a randomized analysis of individual samples with, again, another QC built in with each run, essentially. And this is a, unusual because normally QCs are done in metabolomic workflows, often intermittently every, say, five to 10 runs or so. But here we have every run has a pooled sample. This will be important for quality assurance purposes. Um, and then midway through our runs, we, we do a repeat number 10 here of the QC run and then complete the workflow as, as, as you see here. So you can see there's very, various ways to improve the data quality to analyze large number of samples, but at the same time with full quality assurance. And this just gives you an example of what we would see from a typical serum metabolite extract. Um, if you go back once again for say run number two, um, this will be our total ion lecture program, the blue trace, and then below will be our extracted ion lecture program, say for a compound such as phenylalanine. Here you can see clearly you have three, again, pooled average phenylalanine levels found in the serum. We have the blank sample. There's no carryover effects, no background issues, and then a further uh, repeat of three samples again. So that will give us a good signature that the runs are high quality without any sample carryover effects. And then we can begin, say, if you go back to the run diagram here, say run number three would be your randomized individual samples with the blank and QC. And you can see that for two ions, in particular leucine and isoleucine, in this case you can see seven plugs, but one is a blank, so you see six samples in pairs because they're isomers, so it's 12 result peaks. Um, you have five individual patients here, and a QC will be for, again, an average um, pooled sample from the, from the population. On the right side, you can see um, nominal mass that are isobaric, uh, trimethylamine oxide and glycine. Once again, good separation performance, and you can, all you can see is biological variation from sample to sample, and very good quality in terms of uh, a control chart here. For Now we're pushing this to 1,000 samples. Uh, right now, the first cohort was a 300 samples plus 60 QC, so you can see you can have good measures of quality assurance when, even when, when you're doing this multiplex injection approach with good precision. Intermediate precision, that is. Okay, so um, just to wrap up this part of the introduction is uh, we essentially developed, I think, a modified and what we think is an accelerated workflow for biomarker discovery that takes full advantage of the multiplexing. And I'll go back, I'll reemphasize this as we go through the cystic fibrosis study. Okay, so moving back to cystic fibrosis, and essentially our main question is what is in sweat, essentially? So besides electrolytes, such as chloride or sodium that have been measured in the past, that much is really well, well established in sweat, especially from infants at, say, one month old, essentially. 
And our main question is, um, what other metabolites might be associated with the disease spectrum? CF, as we saw in the past, is not just one classic sort of phenotype, but different types of phenotypes of different severity. Um, and the sweat actually in this case is collected through a process called pilocarpine stimulation, um, ion to freeze, sorry, pilocarpine stimulated ion to freezes. So it's a very a quantitative and reproducible way to collect sweat uh, topically from, in a non-invasive manner as well, from even young infants as well. Um, and you can see that the sweat uh, why salty sweat has always been the hallmark of cystic fibrosis is any mutations that cause impairments in sweat chloride reuptake will then lead to basically a leakage of, of chloride in the sweat, which was, again, still remains a classic gold standard for cystic fibrosis screening. So this is a, a brief overview of our study design. Uh, because it's a, it's a rare disease, we had to pool samples from two uh, pediatric hospitals, including sick kids uh, in Toronto, as well as McMaster Children's Hospital here in Hamilton. Um, we had a total of uh, 50 non-CF cases. So these are all screen positive cases, if you remember with the screening algorithm. The majority of 85% or so of screen positive CF cases typically are uh, either carriers or uh, false positives, essentially. Um, so 50 of these we had as primarily as carriers that are not affected with the disease, and then we had 18 authentic CF cases with high sweat chloride with uh, typically two disease-causing mutations that were identified. And in most cases, we're making use of residual sweat samples, which sometimes were less than two to five microliters or so, so very small amounts of sample remaining after the uh, primary chlorodometer measurements for chloride measurement. Um, this just reiterates the, the study design as it was well-balanced in terms of uh, sex, um, in terms of uh, site as well. Uh, ages were the same in terms of um, confirmatory screening for CF, so the sweat chloride tests. One thing to highlight that all these infants were born uh, normal birth weight, no obvious sign of cystic fibrosis. So again, this is all about presymptomatic screening and diagnosis of the disease. They had normal birth weight. The only difference was in the molecular level is high IRT and then a high sweat chloride in particular. But even you can see in the cases for the cystic fibrosis infants, they're quite still heterogeneous uh, just from a pancreatic status that most of them were, but the CF patients were pancreatic insufficient, but some of them had moderate uh, pancreatic function or were actually sufficient in terms of pancreatic status. So you can see even the CF cases are quite heterogeneous uh, themselves. Um, this just gives an example of uh, a series of targeted assays we developed for inorganic ions, um, which are, have been established to be associated with, uh, again, defects in the CFTR, which is primarily associated with cystic fibrosis. Um, this actually highlights another strength of CE is that you're, you can measure and separate uh, anything from small polar ionic metabolites to inorganic ions to, to proteins, really. But in this case, these were targeted assays for compounds that weren't uh, detectable by mass spectrometry. Uh, in particular, uh, we reconfirmed the elevated chloride, as we'd expect, including sodium. And what's interesting here is thiocyanate, uh, 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 inorganic ion that's not off often measured because it's at sort of low micromolar levels, but actually has quite important. It's also uh, co-transported by CFTR. And any impairments in thiocyanate transport can actually lead to, um, import, um, I guess, lack of function in terms of microbial activity because the thiocyanate is oxidized uh, by many cells that, upon excretion to form this very reactive hypothiocyanate ion. So there's many other compounds that are of interest that we can measure. Um, bicarbonate, which has been claimed to be transported by the same um, protein, we didn't find to be differentiated between the CF and non-CF infants, surprisingly. However, the main focus here is what can we go beyond the targeted known compounds or ions of interest? Can we then expand that to other compounds that at this point we didn't know in advance were present in sweat? In this particular case, all we did um, was repeat the analysis with the multiplex and serial injection in two basically formats. One under acidic conditions, typically one molar formic acid with positive ion mode. This will be for, uh, applied for analysis of cations and sweater on it, ionic compounds. And then repeat the analysis uh, separately uh, for the same sweat sample under alkaline conditions that are negative ion mode, and this is primarily targeted for anions. So each sample is run twice, essentially. In the next slide, you can see here, um, so the first step is, okay, how do we, if we don't know what in sweat, how do we determine what the compounds that are consistently present in sweat that we can measure reliably so? 
And this is a really nice feature of the uh, what we call the multi-segment in, uh, injection capillary electrophoresis mass spectrometry, or MSI-CEMS. If you remember that same format, we're going to inject seven serial plugs of sample <clears throat> in a single run, essentially. But one of our first experiments to do with a new sample that, that's unknown, largely, um, we do what we call a serial uh, dilution trend filter. So we have a pooled sample that we collected from all the inf infants, essentially. And that pooled sample will be, then be serially diluted. You can see in the case for citrulline, uh, we're going to dilute the sample fourfold in two cases for the two first sample injections injected, then do a serial dilution. We include a blank as the sixth sample injected, and then the seventh sample, the last one, is repeat of the first two. So essentially, we have a triplicate injection of a pooled sweat sample, a diluted sample, and then a blank is on top of that. And when we do a molecular feature extract, we extract all ion signals uh, across the mass range that we analyze with our time of flight mass spectrometer. What we'll see is two basic situations. We'll have, in one case, a classic uh, signature. You can see a time resolve signature that tells us right away that this feature is precise, precisely measurable, has a nice linear trend, and there's no background blank contribution. This particular case, we know what the compound is, is citrulline, but in many cases, we don't know what the compound is. We simply have an accurate mass and a relative migration time that we annotate our samples with. Conversely, um, look at the ray trace. This was to be the typical case of a spurious signal, which often is generated with electrospheronization. In fact, the majority of signals in electrospin mass spec are, tend to be spurious in nature. And you can see by this approach, we can simply reject this, ion, this signal, signature because it has no distinct uh, temporal uh, pattern in this particular case. So by using this approach, essentially, we can annotate all the metabolites that satisfy three criteria. Again, reposability, good precision, um, a, a linear trend, but more importantly, no signal from the blank. And by doing so, we'd be able to interrogate, again, commonly measured uh, sweat samples, uh, sweat metabolites uh, present in these screen positive CF infants. Upwards, actually, originally about 74 compounds, we then restricted that to 64 compounds because these were largely present in individual samples more than three quarters of the time. But in most cases, they're either cations or anions. Many compounds were able to identify. Other compounds had different levels of confidence with identification. But moving on, once we were able to basically come up with a targeted list of compounds where we pre-screened, we filtered out all the spurious signals, we then uh, do the analysis, again, of the individual samples, but done, if you remember before, in pairs of samples, so pairs that are injected, but with a distinctive dilution pattern. We'll also include a pool QC as our reference, um, and then repeat the analysis in this way. So these are randomized pairs of samples of our entire cohort that's analyzed. And we'll do either on a positive ion mode, you can see the signature for oxoproline in the bottom left trace, compared to uh, negative ion mode for acidic metabolites, such as lauric acid. In this case, lauric acid, you can see, is quite variable from person to person, in some cases non-detectable in some individuals, um, and highly present in others, as compared to oxoproline, which is much more consistently measurable with lower biological variation. Um, just to cut, cut to the chase here, essentially, is by using this approach, we've been able to identify a number of lead markers besides sweat chloride or biocyanate that distinguish, again, CF infants from the non-CF carriers, essentially, that are unaffected with the disease. One compound you can see in the bottom um, a feature loading score here was glutamine, which you can see is, was elevated in CF and much lower in sweat for the non-CF infants. But one compound in particular was interesting. It was an unknown acidic metabolite. And all we knew in this case had an accurate mass, a relative migration time, and, had, and we didn't know what the structure was, essentially, or its clinical significance. So that really spurned our efforts to try and identify this unknown signature. In this case, of course, we're, we're relying primarily on using the QTOF to acquire, again, uh, collision dissociation experiments and a fragmentation pattern that, in this case, would allow us to help elucidate the structure of the compound. And the top uh, left trace just shows you the challenges when you use mass spec alone. When you generate a, a most likely empirical formula, even with good mass, ac uh, mass error or low mass error, you can still generate um, hundreds, if not thousands, of potential chemical structures from a chem spider database search, which, of course, would lead to a lot of time to help identify the compound. Tendon mass spec often, a product ion scan in this case, can help if you can deduce the structure from its characteristic fragments. In this case, this compound we're able to deduce as being actually a metabolite of the drug used to stimulate the sweat, namely pilocrypic acid.
So this was quite interesting. Um, and we actually had access to an authentic standard in this particular case. So we spiked it. You can see it co-migrates. We have good spectral match of our 10 to mass spectra at the 20 volts collisional of, uh, induced dissociation of that collisional energy. So good matches and the negative ion uh, MSMS spectra, co-migration. So we're very confident that this compound, in fact, is pilocarpic acid. And what's interesting is the infants responded in such a way that reflected the, their drug responsiveness reflected the disease status. And this was quite surprising because it had nothing to do really with CFTR function per se. And you can see pilocarpic acid in the uh, top left trace is, was, I guess, uh, secreted at lower levels in the CF patients compared to non-CF controls. Um, and what we speculate essentially is how, we first had to deduce that this was not a sampling artifact. Maybe the hydrolysis occurred um, during processing. We actually looked at the original gel pads that were used to simulate sweat uh, and collect sweat uh, on infants. We extracted those, and the residual levels of pilocarpic acid was quite low. So we're very confident that the pilocarpic acid, especially in the non-CF patients that are quite elevated, were in fact generated in situ from the sweat gland itself. In fact, there is an enzyme that's been associated with uh, the hydrolysis of this lactam, pilocarpine to pilocarpic acid. It's called peroxinase. And I'll get back to this enzyme uh, in the context of CF later. Um, and now if we just look at the data in its entire scope here, if you look at the original data without any um, data transformation here, we're using non-parametric statistical analysis with uh, multiple hypothesis correction as well, four compounds were consistently found as lead compounds to discriminate between CF and non-CF infants. Once again, pilocarpic acid was our lead compound with very good uh, effect size and, and full change and, and passes uh, bond for any correction for that matter. Asparagine and glutamine were two neutral amino acids, which were um, interesting to note as well. And the third compound here was uh, something very intriguing because it was totally unexpected. This is uh, monoethylhexyl phthalic acid, which you might know is a metabolite of a plasticizer that we're all exposed to. This also was an interesting uh, discovery, essentially. Once again, from just uh, an elemental composition, you can generate uh, you know, thousands of potential structures. But in this case, we had to rely on a characteristic MSMS spectra to help us elucidate the structure. But before we did that, we went back to the data. Remember, we do these runs, the QC runs that we do all the time each day. So you can see in this case, the blank sample was very low. This, so this compound is not uh, an artifact from the background. It has a very distinctive dilution trend filter, so we're confident this compound can be measured reliably, so in the, both the pool sample but also individual samples. And uh, we know it's acidic, and essentially we deduced that this compound, in fact, was this uh, compound in the below here, this monoexohethyl phthalic acid. Even this, this compound, this vitamin E metabolite, you can see we can easily deduce and differentiate them based on the next spectra here. So here we, we had a candidate, we actually, uh, it was commercially available, so we were able to purchase it, spike it in our sweat sample, show, demonstrate co-migration, and very good, again, MSMS spectral match as well. That's about 90% for all the fragments uh, in terms of the relative intensities. Um, and in fact, we had the same max spectra that was published as well that was also a good confidence booster for identifying this compound. Um, and so what we speculate that is this, this plasticizer, in fact, is likely metabolized by the same enzyme that's associated with the uh, pilocarpine hydrolysis as well, and I'll get back to that quite shortly as well. Just to summarize once again, of the four lead compounds in sweat that we've shown to be differentiated uh, between the CF and non-CF infants, um, two compounds, uh, asparagine and glutamine, or so-called endogenous metabolites or nutrients, um, they're likely co-transported uh, by transporters that are dependent on uh, sodium or chloride, so we, we, we weren't so much interested in those compounds. And they have generally have pretty good discriminatory um, um, potential in terms of the area under curves well, well above 0.75. But what was really interesting is these two exogenous compounds, which, again, we uh, were able to discover. Uh, they're exogenous compounds, yet they do reflect something about the CF disease status, but nothing in terms of the CFTR function. Um, and you can see in both cases, they're consistently lower in the CF sweat samples compared to the non-CF cases. In fact, both pilocarpic acid and MHP, this plasticizer metabolite, are well correlated with each other from a spinner and crank correlation plot as well. So we deduce that they're likely uh, metabolized by a common enzyme, essentially. So how is this related to CF? This is a big, I think, um, uh, discovery from this work, essentially, is we have evidence, essentially, that both these 
exogenous compounds, how the infant responds to the drug used to stimulate the sweat, and how they metabolize uh, an environmental uh, toxin that's present uh, and usually likely exposed prenatally. Both tell us that likely that in CF uh, infants have a deficiency in this enzyme called perioxinase, which the name suggests it actually metabolizes uh, xenobiotics like um, uh, pesticides, in fact. But it also has important roles in terms of mediating inflammation and it's involved with lipid metabolism as well. And the more work and literature search we've done on this particular enzyme, we've shown that it's been long associated with cystic fibrosis, in fact. And it actually plays a really important role for mediating uh, biofilm formation because it actually hydrolyzes the same lactam motif. So these form sensing molecules below, you can see above the biofilm uh, image there. These are also lactams that are secreted by, say, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And this just shows you the interaction between the host and the bacteria have big impacts in terms of uh, biofilm formation, of course, is the hallmark of recurrent lung infections and chronic lung infections in cystic fibrosis cases. But I think we have some evidence we can infer from our data that even infants at one month old that are pre-symptomatic, that there's also, there's also an evidence of a deficiency of this enzyme that could be a potential target for therapy as well. And just to end off this seminar, I just want to talk on one case study. And this kind of, I guess, reiterates the importance of newborn screening programs, especially for cystic fibrosis. So this was a, a, basically an adolescent uh, patient. She was identified symptomatically or diagnosed symptomatically. She was 13 years at the time of diagnosis. So she was born prior to the advent of newborn screening for CF here in Ontario, the province of Ontario. So unfortunately, she was diagnosed quite late in life and most likely involved uh, our rotations of different specialists until she uh, was uh, identified or diagnosed by our physician here in the CF clinic at McMaster. She actually had a CFTR genotype that was actually eligible for uh, an interesting therapy called um, potentiators. Uh, this is Ivocaptor that's manufactured by Vertex. She had this G551D um, mutation status, so it's quite responsive to this therapy that acts as a potentiator and a chaperone to improve function of CFTR. So in this case, we had repeat sweat samples at the point of diagnosis. You can see in the table on top here, because she was at the point of diagnosis quite uh, underweight in terms of body weight and height, poor lung function, both from a forced exhaled volume at one second and a forced vital capacity as well. And the sweat chloride you can see is well above the 60 millimolar cutoff, so classic CF in this case. She then underwent uh, classic uh, or conventional CF management, including nutritional supplementation and physiotherapy. A good benefit here was increase in, in, in body weight, and, um, and, but no real change in the lung function. And you can see the sweat chloride at the second time point was quite this, pretty much the same. Um, with three months of the Ivocaptor uh, treatment with ongoing CF management, you can see a pronounced uh, actually uh, improvement in the lung function. And more importantly, uh, you can see in the bottom of the third column here that the drastic reduction of sweat chloride as well, a good functional indicator that this individual is quite responsive to the therapy that led to improved lung function. So with these three repeat samples from the one individual, we basically wanted to uh, interrogate the sweat metabolome as we did with the infants to see whether or not there's other signatures that re reflect disease responsiveness to both nutritional intervention, but more importantly, with the advent of the potentiator. And what really stood out with the metabolites was um, two compounds in particular, uric acid, you can see has a sudden increase in sweat excretion just with the onset of ivacaptor treatment. And the bottom uh, xanthine, uh, you can see there's a dramatic reduction of the sweat chloride, uh, sorry, of the uh, sweat xanthine excretion in this individual patient. In fact, uric acid and xanthine, of course, are substrate and product of an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. So from this just preliminary study, we've shown some evidence that this avocaptor not only acts as a potentiator for CFTR, but potentially can actually activate xanthine oxidase, which also is quite important for mediating oxidative stress and inflammation as well. And some of these other markers, including asparagine and MHP that we saw with the infants, are also quite responsive markers, um, not only from the infant standpoint, but also from older uh, children uh, undergoing uh, therapeutic intervention. With that, I want to end off. Um, hopefully, you get a, at least some of a, I guess, uh, uh, idea of how you can develop new techniques to improve sample throughput yet without sacrificing data quality. That's quite important for large-scale clinical or epidemiological studies.
Um, we think we demonstrated the first characterization of a sweat metabolome um, from screen positive CF infants. Um, the, uh, this multiplex separation technique for us has been really a game changer for improving our sample throughput. It allows for actually really interesting data workflows that reflect the experimental design. And more importantly, you can integrate sort of high quality QCQA practices to reduce false discoveries. And the whole notion here is you're temporally encoding the mass spectrum through signal pattern recognition. Um, although sweat cloud is still the remain, remains the gold standard for CF diagnosis, you can see that these new markers actually provide new insights with the disease pathophysiology and might be important for understanding how disease progresses, how it varies from individuals, and how individuals respond to treatment as well. So the most exciting finding from this work was the unexpected discovery of these exogenous compounds, the drug, and how the infants respond to the drug used to stimulate sweat and any prenatal exposures to a uh, uh, ubiquitous plasticizer also gives us indication of the disease status that um, it, it goes beyond the CFTR primary mutation itself. Um, we're currently doing the same approach for improving screening for CF using drug blood spots as well and uh, doing a, a long-term birth cohort study as well uh, to, to basically uh, predict, uh, I guess, a disease risk in infants from, uh, from again, prenatal programming as well. And all, all the motivation here is about how we can improve public precision medicine to prevent disease risk in the early stages of life. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I welcome any questions you might have, um, and thank, again, our partners as well as our sponsors as well. Thank you. Thank you for that important presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, can you explain how the serial injection format used in MSI CMS do, does not lead to ion suppression? How is this different from flow injection in MS? Can, and can the same approach be used in LCMS? Okay, um, thank you for the question, Marjorie. So um, let's see, if I can bring back the slide earlier in the introduction, um, that might help explain that question more. So this trace here, you can see, this is, again, an analysis in a multiplex fashion. Again, seven sample plugs injected in that single capillary um, with a real plasma filtrate sample. So still lots of residual salt remaining, which in this case, if you did a direct infusion of this plasma filtrate sample, it would lead to suppression. You likely wouldn't, able, you wouldn't be able to measure many of the low abundance features uh, or metabolites present there. But the nice thing about the, the effective uh, the multiplex injection format is that the, the throughput you can see is effectively within 20 to 30 minutes. So effectively the uh, throughput is roughly about three to four minutes per sample, which is on par to direct infusion. So throughput wise, it's comparable to direct infusion mass spec, but the data quality is way more improved because again, you still retain the separation performance uh, in terms of res resolving isomers, but and more importantly for salty samples such as plasma or urine, you can see that the E function is still is a very good desalter. So you desalt the samples prior to ionization, prior to, again, of, uh, and all the samples are, again, uh, enter the ion source offset in time within a matter of minutes, essentially. So it really achieves the throughput that you get from direct infusion mass spec, yet retains all the benefits of a separation performance. And more importantly, it avoids suppression because it acts as a really good desalter. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. And the next question is, two of the lead sweat compounds associated with cystic fibrosis are not natural metabolites. Can they, can be, can they be considered authentic biomarkers for cystic fibrosis? Yes, good point. And this question has been asked in the past quite a bit. And um, yeah, there, and this was a controversial notion, essentially. So like this slide again, uh, the best performing marker by chemical marker in this case was in fact pelicarpic acid as evaluated based on uh, statistical significance, but also from an air under curve, from a receiver operating characteristic curve basis. Yet this compound is not native to sweat, but is actually a result of the metabolism of the drug used to stimulate sweat. So. Yes, it's not a classic biomarker in the conventional sense, 
Um, and it might not be useful to, to measure routinely for diagnosis, but I think biomarker from this standpoint is not only for diagnosis or prognosis, but biomarkers can also provide insight in terms of disease pathophysiology or mechanisms of, of, of di disease development. And this is precisely what I think both these exogenous compounds led us to understand that these infants not only had CFTR dysfunctions and how they uh, in, impacted sweat chloride transport or sweat thiocyanate transport for that matter, but also they had other underlying deficiencies and other enzymes that most likely are um, modified or gene modifiers from the same primary mutation. So these infants not only have problems with sweat chloride transport, but they have problems metabolizing uh, xenobiotics essentially, including drugs and uh, environmental exposures. So, um, so yeah, from a biomarker standpoint, these might not be uh, quite useful from a, uh, a diagnostic standpoint, but provide new insights in terms of disease path pathophysiology. And that's the whole basis of the non-target analysis and discovery and, and, and in terms of challenging accepted notions, certainly in the cystic fibrosis world. Hopefully that answered their question. Thank you for the answer. And the next question is, could you clarify how non-targeted metabolite profiling is performed when using a dilution trend filter in MSIC-MS for a poorly characterized biofluid such as sweat? Okay. Uh, thank you, Marjorie. Um, if I go to a slide, that might show you once again how that was done. Um, yeah, so this is slide that really illustrates the use of the dilution trend filter. So essentially, um, it's a very simple, it's a one experiment um, thing we need to do in this case. So we just do one untargeted analysis on a pooled sample. So this is a pooled sample from the entire cohort. So these are going to be common features um, that are present in most individuals, at least in most infants in this particular case. <clears throat> and with the multiplex injection method, because we're injecting seven samples in a single run, we're going to be injecting, again, the same sweat, pooled sweat sample, but now we're going to encode information through dilution patterning here. So once again, you can see by the dilution pattern on the left side, this is a, an expected, uh, I guess, temporal pattern that we'd expect for a compound that is present in sweat because for two reasons, or for three reasons, um, you can see that the blank, there's no signal or no measurable signal in the blank run, that's uh, injection number six. We're confident that this compound is not an artifact uh, or background signal. Um, more importantly, the replicate injection of the three uh, replicates at the same dilution can be have very good precision. You can see the CV below is uh, under 5%. So this is a feature that is not in the blank. Um, we can reliably measure it. And importantly, it also undergoes a dilution trend trend as well, so it's a linear dilution um, trend as well. So we're very confident that this compound, which we happen to know in this case, is uh, an authentic compound. So this is how we do feature selection. But the problem is when you do molecular feature extraction, typically with non-target analysis, is you always challenge in yourself is how do you dis differentiate what is real and what's an artifact? And because of the multiplexing ability, you have redundant information. So in this case, sometimes we see signals that happen once, even though we've injected samples seven times and have a blank sample. Here you can see this spurious signal has no distinctive pattern. So we're going to exclude this from our list of features. And the funny thing about electrospray is you generate lots of these types of spurious signals. Um, and most metabolic workflows, they really don't deal with uh, this type of filtering until later stages of the data processing. Here we do it as a first, the, our very first thing we do is we do, remove spurious signals uh, from the get-go. So we have a smaller number of features, but uh, features in most cases that we're very, very confident with. Um, so that's, this is our approach. Before we do any individual analysis of samples, we do a so-called dilution trend filter on a pooled sample and basically derive a list of compounds that have been pre-vetted, essentially, that have been authenticated um, for, for our purpose. At this point, we still don't know which ones are clinically relevant from the study design, but we just know what either what they are, or even if they're unknown, we know that they're, they're real and we can reliably measure them. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay, we have time for one last question. What are the major limitations of CEMS technology? Why is it not more widely used in metabolomic studies? Okay, uh, thanks Marjorie, that's a good question. Um, and it's true that uh, CMS typically is 
not widely used in the metabolic field for various per, uh, reasons. Um, first and foremost, uh, I think the one limitation it has is because you inject um, typically 10 nanoliters of sample on column is often 100 times less than in the typical LC separation. So in terms of concentration sensitivity, um, the sensitivity and coverage is generally less than you would get from LC because you simply inject 100 times less sample on column. Um, but that's also a benefit because if you're dealing with very small amounts of sample, you can make use of those uh, and, and actually inject them reliably so. Um, so sensitivity is limited, especially with conventional sheath liquid interfaces. However, there's new developments of uh, sheath list or low flow interfaces that have shown improvements in sensitivity. <clears throat> um, other limitations, I think, is uh, often CE uh, has larger, I guess, uh, variations in migration time or for chromatographers, retention time. Um, this is a, often a misperception or misconception in this case because in CE, what's a really critical parameter is not uh, migration time, but it's actually electrophoretic mobility is the physical chemical parameter. Unfortunately, software that's developed for CE still relies on LC-based approaches. So, in fact, this is really the, the need for vendors to kind of develop more software tools that are more uh, suited for CE, um, not for LC. So you can easily correct for variations in migration time by either having internal standards or simply measuring electric osmotic flow. So, but most people are kind of used to kind of seeing migration times or retention times, and that's how it's typically presented nonetheless. So, so overall, I think uh, sensitivity limitations and uh, reproducibility, especially in terms of migration time, are con often perceived limitations for CE, but there's been some recent work to, to address those. And, I think with our approach with the multiplex, and in fact, even if there's time variations, it really doesn't have an impact because all the samples vary with respect to each other. We're just looking for a temporal pattern. So it, it really, the normalization or migration time variations are less uh, critical in that particular case. But I think for us, this has been a game changer. You can now increase throughput almost an order of magnitude. And, this is, and you can analyze samples that you couldn't really do readily with more large scale separations. Um, especially for the case for these sweat samples. So for us, we, we had no other recourse. The CE was a perfect, um, ideal um, technique for this particular case. Hopefully that answers your questions. I would like to once again thank Dr. Philip Britz McKibben for his presentation. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Agilent Technologies, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2017. You'll receive an email from Labroots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time, and goodbye. Thank you.